So, um, let's start the fun part of the evening, so the talk, of course. Uh, since, uh, well, you know who is the speaker, so Chris Welty, so it doesn't need much introduction except one, a couple of slides, uh, which will reveal his, uh, well, uh, uh, thoughts, which are predictions, actually, which he, uh, which he made in 2007. Okay. So, this presentation, these slides are not mine, really. These are Chris's. I just took them from the invited talk from ISWC from 2007, from Busan. Some of you were there. So, let's start. So, the first slide is really uh, just a CV. So, then there's a couple of slides of predictions. Uh, okay, uh, press the first button. So, he was born in New York, early 60s. So this is not, nothing bad, really. Eh? Okay, uh, early expert on everything, so we know this. Eh? Uh, disappointing, disappointment with Buck Rogers, so uh, some space hero. Anyway, doesn't matter. Everybody was disappointed, so let's go on. On. Uh, so in his early years, he was able to sum up, you know, so many numbers in so short time. So amazing. Uh, but the result was 5,100, uh, so, but the real answer is, well, it was close, to be honest. Uh, now his predictions, so this, this is why we, we have these slides. Eh? So he made his first prediction in 79, uh, 75, that he will marry this, uh, the lady, uh, well, seems it failed. Eh? Okay, now uh, going to his professional career. He was always about predictions, you know. Um, and his first prediction was about email. Uh, we won't go detailed through the slides. I can copy them, I have memory stick. Uh, so his first uh, prediction was about email that it will fail. No, no, well, no one will really uh, want to write emails, so the first version of email. On. Second generation email, again, prediction, in the same way. He was partially right, actually. Uh, uh, so these are these uh, meat items here. Uh, on the bottom you have what he missed. Okay. On. Then DNS. He didn't believe in it. Uh, Okay, somehow we still use this uh, on HTTP. Well, this was, you know, actually, this was my thought as well. First time when I saw this HTTP, it looked like really too simple in a way. Uh, 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 so uh, let's continue on this, uh, please. Yeah, okay, Web 2.0, next prediction, complete failure. Uh, which didn't happen. Next, semantic web. Again, uh, prediction. Did it happen or not? Uh, we still don't know. We still don't know. Uh, uh, so, uh, so much about Chris uh, for the start. Uh, so now, basically, why we invited him? To make new predictions, of course. Uh, so whatever he predicts, you know, it's wrong. Please invest. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, so, as you see. So, uh, Chris, please. I'm stuck. <laughs> he got stuck, you know. Cheers, <laughs> Ladies, help him. Okay, so thank you, everyone. Uh, glad to be here uh, in Crete, enjoying the uh, food and the sun and the beach. As most of you know, we recently uh, completed this project uh, at IBM called Watson to play a game show, a trivia uh, quiz show, against the best human players at the game. So we played two games of this show, uh, and the way the game works is um, three players compete against each other, and you answer a lot of factoid questions. Um, 
and you give the answers and you have to know if you get the answer right you win money if you get the answer wrong you lose money so you have to decide if you're gonna play or not you're gonna you have to know if you know the answer and this was a huge innovation um, something that had never been done before by a machine to, to not just give a document but to give the answer and to know accurately whether the answer was right or wrong so in order to accomplish this we had to do obviously a lot of engineering and we built a system and we applied a really rigorous engineering methodology and one of the things we did a lot was error analysis so we would take questions uh, that we got wrong try to figure out why we got them wrong try to come up with solutions and then run it again and see if we got as a result of fixing that one question, if we got new questions wrong, because that always happens. It's like, you know, this game where you whack moles. As soon as one head pops up, you hit it, and another head pops up someplace else. So uh, go to the next slide. Here's a question that we, uh, an early version of Watson, uh, got wrong. The category is fatherly nicknames. And the question, this Frenchman was the father of bacteriology. Anyone know the answer? Louis Pasteur, of course, everyone knows that. Watson's answer? <laughs> How tasty was my little Frenchman? Now, what, no, no, back, back. Get, get that one back up. So, so this was an interesting one. Um, this was a very early version of the system that was based primarily on search. And the algorithm that we started with, we called this our baseline system, it basically used s standard keyword search over Wikipedia pages and returned as answers the title. And this is the title of a Brazilian film about cannibalism. And it turns out to be, it's a very short article about a film that uh, I'm sure everyone's heard of it, right? Um, it was a, a, you know, a story about uh, some French explorers coming to, uh, to South America a long time ago and being eaten. So the Wikipedia description is very short, and it mentions Frenchmen a lot. So the TF-IDF score for this turned into a keyword search for that document was incredibly high, and it got a really good score, so that's why I thought it was the answer. Okay, next one. <clears throat> so we knew we needed to go well beyond TF-IDF type of measures of, of keywords. We needed a little bit more than that. So the next question we'll look at, sound like a local. This is an American culture question, but I think you'll all get it. To pass for a native of Danvers, Massachusetts, don't pronounce this letter in the town's name. Watson's answer. Now see, that's funny because G is not in the town's name. Whether you know the answer or not, it's definitely not G. Why is it definitely not G? It's not, it's not a letter in the town's name. So this is what we call a lexical constraint. And these are really tough because you're basically asking the computer to respond to natural language and run a procedure as a result. Check your answer, you know, check each letter in the, in the word and see if that answers the question. So we call these lexical constraints, and they do them a lot, like the word's got to start with S, or it's got to uh, you know, contain two vowels, or something like that. And it's very hard, except that you pre-build procedure. You try to predict ahead of time what every possible lexical constraint might be, write a procedure for each one of those lexical constraints, and then also build recognizers to know when a question is ask asking you to do that. There are a lot of possible lexical constraints. There's no other way to do it. Next question. <clears throat> There's a first time for everything is the category. In 1824, this first foreigner to address a joint session of Congress, that's U.S. Congress, congratulated the U.S. on its growth. Watson's answer? So, a couple things. This was another early version of the system. It didn't really understand dates yet. Um, it also, well, the challenge in this one is the type of thing the question is asking for is foreigner. 
So, I mean, anyone can be, I'm a foreigner here. Anyone can be a foreigner. What does it mean to be a foreigner? In this case, it's incredibly contextual. It means you have to read a lot into the question. This is not really a problem we were ultimately ever able to solve, although by adding some temporal constraints, recognition and processing of temporal constraints in the clue, we can at least throw this one out as obviously, you know, not doesn't make any sense from a temporal perspective because he wasn't alive at that time. Okay, next one. <clears throat> the Prime Minister of India is the category. The Prime Minister's official residence is found at number seven Racecourse Road in this city. Watson's answer? That says Islamabad. So in case you didn't know, Islamabad is not where, that's in Pakistan, that's not where the, pres the Prime Minister of India's offices are. Now why did we get this answer wrong? And this worried a lot of people too because they were like, we, we can't be on national terrorism and like insult entire countries. <clears throat> you know, you guys got to fix this. Uh, so why do we get this one wrong? Because actually in some of our corpora, when they mentioned, you know, you, you were, there's this uh, natural language property called metonymy. When you associate a country with the location of its government, there were a lot of articles talking about the communication between the government of India and the government uh, of Pakistan. And so this association was made. All right, next question. The category milestones in 1994, 1994, 25 years after this event, okay, 25 years after this event, the, the event we're looking for, one participant said, for one crowning moment, we were creatures of the cosmic ocean. Does anyone know the answer? The moon landing, the first moon landing is the answer. Watson's answer. 25 years ago. As we know, the Big Bang. Well, 25 years ago was, you know, a time where there were really big parties, and that's what Watson was talking about. So, you know, Watson doesn't really know. Again, this was a version of Watson that still didn't quite understand dates very well. And, um, you know, there was a big association between uh, Cosmos and the Big Bang, and this was something that was frequently referred to as a, an important event. Uh, and so uh, some of the less semantic scores in Watson uh, gave this a high weight. All right, next question. Rich fellas is the category. The two millionaires Jacqueline Bouvier married. Anyone know the answer? Okay, John F. Kennedy and Aristotle Onassis. Jacqueline Bouvier was uh, Kennedy's wife. Watson's answer? Patty and Selma Bouvier. Who knows who Patty and Selma Bouvier are? Okay, they're, the, they're Marge's sisters in The Simpsons. <laughs> this is an interesting one. So we struggled very early on in getting questions right where the answer was more than one thing, like two things or three things, questions that asked for a couple, uh, a pair, um, or in this case these two. And when we finally fixed, or when we, the first version of the system to fix that took an approach that really highly weighted answers that um, were uh, pairs, or if you were looking for two things, and this is the title of a Wikipedia page, okay, because each of the characters does not have their own page, since in the show they're always shown together. So there is a Wikipedia page called Patty and Selma Bouvier, and since that is a pair, it knew that that was two things, and there was an association with the last name, it got a high score, it overwhelmed the others. Next question. In the category of geography, the Denmark Strait separates these two islands by about 200 miles. Anyone? Denmark Strait, Iceland and Greenland. Greenland. Iceland and Greenland is the answer. Watson's answer. <laughs> Time on. 
<laughs> Greenland and Taiwan. Yeah. Taiwan. Now, you may not know miles, but you probably guessed it's a little more than 200 miles apart. This is again a tough one. So when we fixed the problem with the last question, uh, we ended up getting things like this wrong because we're now trying to put our top two answers together. And Taiwan came up in second place. So we knew we were looking for two things. You didn't know what separated by 200 miles meant. So we knew we were looking for two things. Um, and so we took the top two answers. And somehow Taiwan ended up as the top answer um, really more because of a keyword associations um, and uh, Denmark, uh, uh, not Denmark, Iceland had not been listed at that time in some of our sources as an island. It was only listed as a country. So it was ranking Greenland high and Taiwan high because it knew they were islands. Uh, it didn't already know Iceland was an island. We ultimately fixed that, but it was, so this was a problem in actually our structured sources. Next question. Hoaxes. In 1991, two Englishmen said they'd spent 13 years sneaking around fields creating these. Anyone know the answer? Crop circles. Watson's answer? I don't think I need to explain this one at all. Next question. Happy Meals. Grasshoppers eat primarily this. Anyone? Grass. Grasshoppers eat grass. Watson's answer? So we added this Engram scorer to the system. Elena, you are laughing. We added this uh, Engram scorer to the system. And the uh, eats primarily blank engram was completely dominated by this. So if you search the web for that engram, uh, this is what you're going to end up with significantly more frequent than anything else. <clears throat> so uh, these are the kinds of things we need to account for with other kinds of knowledge. Next question. Political terms. <laughs> Politically speaking, it's a cause that looks promising. You can join by jumping on it. Anyone? Bandwagon. The bandwagon. Jumping on the bandwagon, okay? It means you're just doing what everyone else wants to do. Jumping on the bandwagon. Watson's answer. <laughs> you also have to imagine, you didn't get to hear it, but you know, Watson has a kind of strange intonation on some things. So this came out as, what is my balls? <sighs> well, it, we had to remove some sources from Watson's knowledge before. It's a source problem. Next question. State laws. Denny, this is for you. How old do you have to be to get married in South Carolina? state in the United States. Any guesses? Okay, the right answer is 14. 14. Watson's answer, he was giving advice. It was just, it was just advice. Uh, really had a hard time with numbers. I don't know if you guys know this, but there are a lot of them. Um, so we had a hard time generating, and still actually today, the, what saved us here was there weren't a lot of questions um, in the competition that asked for numbers. But Watson had a hard time with judging numbers. We didn't do a lot with it because it didn't come up that often in the show. Uh, so in this case, you know, it was looking for certain kinds of associations. It didn't actually have this information or know how to access it in any semantic source. So it was sort of a guess. Next question, music. Barry, this one's for you. What is the text of an opera called? Okay, more people knew that one, libretto. Watson's answer. That's what I call it, Michael. I don't know where this one came from. 
<laughs> Next question. <clears throat> the Queen's English. Give a Brit a tinkle when you get into town, and you've done this. Anyone? You've called them on the phone. Made a phone call. Watson's answer. So that's what tinkle means in American English. Uh, didn't recognize that it was looking for British, a British English definition. So it actually had very high confidence that this was the right answer. <laughs> <laughs> Knew it was a definition question, and this was the definition of tinkle. <clears throat> uh, is that the last one? Next one? No. So I want to leave you with uh, just one message uh, after that. So we went through a lot of that engineering, fixing a lot of problems. Uh, correcting some sources, but one of the things we did in order to succeed on this project, and we did succeed, we, we beat the best human players by a substantial margin. It was awesome. <laughs> and uh, one of the things we did was break the traditional view of how language is processed. That there was this pipeline, this stack, with a very unidirectional flow of information. Language gets translated into knowledge through some machine process that produces some meaning representation of language. And that, next, the goal is just to cross this divide, this gap. That's not supposed to look like India. It's supposed to look like a chasm that has to be crossed. And this is the, you'll find this in AI textbooks. And there's a lot, next slide, there, there's a, no, a lot of, keep going. Um, two more. One more. There's a lot of problems with this. I'm not going to go into the details. This, the NLP community has been thinking about this for a long time and never succeeded really. And in many cases, just given up on this idea. And what the NLP community does use far more often than techniques developed in communities like this, like semantic technologies or knowledge representation and reasoning technologies, they do use things like information retrieval, machine learning. They don't use a lot of semantic technology because the people have been assuming this is the way you're going to go about it. We broke this view. Next slide. Because we do not think knowledge is the destination. Next. Instead, we're changing this. You define some task that you want to do using language as supporting material for it. And semantic technology is a supporting technology for, these, for performing these tasks, just like these others. Just like parsing, just like information extraction, just like machine learning. If you don't have knowledge as part of the solution, you will fail. But if you try to think that you can produce, accurately produce knowledge from text, you will fail. So it was just another technique in, in, in our bag of techniques. And we used a lot of different sources from the semantic web, DBpedia, we used Wikipedia categories, and they helped. They helped a lot. But we didn't, we didn't turn the questions into logic and solve them by running queries. Thank you. Now I wanted to um, analyze several scenes from The Matrix. I mean, no, I'm not going to do The Matrix this year. Instead, I'm going to do Lord of the Rings. Bring that up. Just kidding. I'm finished. Am I supposed to dance now? or?